Let's open our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter 5. We're excited about all that God is doing here in the life and ministry of our church. Aren't you thankful to be part of the local church? Yeah. Man, there's nothing greater in all the world than the local church. And uh, the church is, is the body of Christ in the community. Just think of that, that great responsibility that God has, has rested upon our shoulders to be His ambassadors. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says, Now they are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, praying us in Christ, said, Be ye reconciled to God. And uh, just very thankful for what the church is. And of course, you and I, we've been bought with a price. Uh, the Bible says that the Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. And that you and I can be part of something so grand and spectacular as a local church is a very humbling thing. I heard a preacher once say, you know, God doesn't need us. And that's true, he doesn't. Uh, at the moment of salvation, he could just snatch us right home to heaven. But he's chosen to leave us here for a while. Sometimes we wonder why exactly. You know, man is a few days and full of trouble. Uh, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And we often wonder, like, why, why God is doing what He's doing? Why God is allowing uh, what He allows? And why He's left us here? May I tell you this morning that God has something for you. God has something for everyone in this room. You're not too young. You're not too old. You're not too weak. But you might be too strong. See, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yes, it wasn't until um, we, were, we need to be little in our own eyes. Think of, of King Saul in the Old Testament. How God, how, how God used him so greatly there early on in his life. He used him when he was small in his own sight. Then Saul became big in his own sight. And that was enough of Saul. And God found a man named, a young man, a little lad, perhaps a young teenage boy at the time named David. And he was the youngest of his father's house. The least li he was voted least likely by his father and all of his brethren to succeed in life. Remember when, when King Samuel went and... Um, and under the commission of God to go to, to Bethlehem to anoint the next king over, over Israel. He goes into Jesse's house and, and Jesse parades all of his boys before the prophet of God. And God said, it's none of these. But he found David, a man after God's own heart. God used him. Church, I want to be honest with you this morning. I'm not... I'm going to preach a message I didn't intend to preach today. So if it takes me a little while to get going, you understand why. But all kidding aside, I believe that God has brought us to a crossroads as a church. I believe the Lord has brought us to a place of decision. And the question we have to answer today is, what direction will we go? Will we do what we want? Will we do what we think is best? Or will we follow the Lord Jesus Christ? In the Gospel according to Luke, in chapter 5, we're introduced here to a man named Peter, called Simon. And the Lord introduced himself to this man. I, I believe Peter was familiar with Jesus at this time, but, but didn't quite understand the significance of who Jesus is. Remember, Jesus is not merely a man. He is the God-man. He is 100% man, of course. But He's also 100% God. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In John chapter 1 the Apostle describes Christ being by stating this, in the beginning was the Word, who is Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Do you believe that? In Luke chapter 5, the Lord introduces himself to a man named Peter, who was just an, just an ordinary Joe. There was nothing great or glorious about Peter. He was a rough man. He was a fisherman by trade. He grew up on the northern shore, the north, uh, northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee in a town called Capernaum. And it was here, also known as the Sea of Gennesaret, that Jesus Christ introduced himself to this man. And if you're able, I invite you to stand with me this morning. We're going to read here in, in chapter 5 of Luke. We begin reading in verse number 1. We're going to read down to verse number 11. Follow along with me, if you would please, beginning in verse 1 of Luke chapter 5. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. When they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draw of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Father, we're thankful for the word of God today. We understand the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, it's a hammer that breaks the rock to pieces, but it's also sweeter than honey to our taste. Lord, our, our desire this morning is that you would open our eyes to the truth of thy Word. Lord, that you would teach us great and mighty things today. That you would help us to see things as clearly as you've stated them. Lord, again, you've brought us to a place of decision today. And Father, our desire is to simply say yes to you. Some, sometimes, Father, we were reluctant to do what you've called us to do. We're perhaps a bit timid, a bit intimidated. Sometimes we question the logic of things as we perceive them. But Father, may we not see things as we would see things, but as you would see things. Lord, we ask today that you'd bring us all in line with your word and with your will and that we would do exactly what the Bible tells us today. Lord, we need revival. We need to return to that place of obedience in our Christian lives. God, we pray for your grace and leadership this morning. And once again, Lord, if there's anyone joining us today 
who does not know Christ as their Savior, Father, our prayer for them is that today would be the day of their salvation. And so, Lord, we humbly yield ourselves to you. We pray for your power today, your leadership alone, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Bible says in verse number 4. A twofold command, really, that Christ gives in that verse. As he left speaking, he said unto Simon, notice what the Bible says. He said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. I want you to note the expressions, launch out and let down. Launch out and let down. Are you willing this morning to obey the Lord? I mean, this, the, the command is, is quite simple. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And the question we pose this morning is simple. Have you launched out into the deep? Have you let down your nets for a draught? I believe the greatest days of Pickerington Baptist Temple rest in the future. While we have looked out as we celebrate our, our church's nine-year anniversary this month, in just a few weeks from today, we can look back over, over the course of the time God's given, and we, see, we can see the, and witness all the great and miraculous things that God has done. Consider this, that tens of thousands of pieces of gospel literature have been distributed door to door and through the mail by this local church. I don't have a, an exact total, but I would dare say at least 100,000 pieces of gospel literature in some form, whether our John and Romans that we just put out, nearly uh, 15,000 of those, 20, nearly 20,000 uh, gospel flyers this week alone. We're thankful for what Christ has done. And while we've seen hundreds make a profession of faith in Christ and, and witness do, do, uh, scores of people uh, obey Christ in the waters of baptism and, and, and be led into this life of true discipleship, I believe that this is not the ending, it's only the beginning. Many of us can remember all the things that God has done for us. I mean, you consider the, the miracle that you're sitting in today. Remember earlier this year, God provided our church $85,000 in a month. We, had, we didn't have it. He provided it for us. And all, all of this property belongs to Pickerington Baptist Temple. Not for us to just sit on and hoard to ourselves, but to use for His glory. Amen. How many remember early on, I'm reminded, uh, Linda Grass isn't here this morning, but every time I think of the sidewalk out front, I remember... It had, I, I think it had hands on it. You know what I'm talking about? You walk by and it just reaches up and trips you. Remember that little step that was out on the landing here? And God provided for that. We were able to pour new sidewalks. And that was, that was, a, big, that was a big step of faith for our, our little church. And then it happened. Remember, Brother Dean, the furnace went out? He thought I was cheap before. And it was hot. It was cold. God miraculously provided for new furnaces for the church. Remember all the great things that God had, has done. Expanding our current parking lot. Building renovations upon building renovations. But may I tell you that God is not done with Pickerington Baptist Temple. Amen. This is not the end. Yes. It's only the beginning. Yes. And we're praying, we're seeking God for revival. I believe that, that everything we need from the Lord hinges upon, or swings upon the, the pendulum of revival. What is revival? Revival, of course, you think of this great excitement and enthusiasm for God and His work and witnessing people come to know Christ as their Savior and uh, just, just great things taking place. And it, perhaps that's the, that's the byproduct of revival. But what is revival? 
Revival is not between you and me. Revival is between you and the Lord. Revival is a biblical principle for God's people. And it speaks of one returning to obedience to Christ. I was talking with someone just yesterday. I, I came to know the Lord as my Savior January 7th, 1989. It was a long time ago. I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. He gave me life. The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And I was born again of God's Spirit. Amen. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. That which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. Jesus saith unto him, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And I remember when I, was, when I was freshly saved. How many of you remember the day you accepted Christ as your Savior? Say amen. amen. Do you remember how excited you were? I couldn't walk on water, but man, I, I probably could have tried. I was excited. I was enthused, to say the least. Didn't you want to tell as many people as you could about the Lord? Didn't you want to live your life for Him? And you understood that there was a purpose and that there was a reason to live far beyond yourself. You understood that, that God had called you to live a life for His glory alone. That life is no longer about me. I no longer belong to me. You realize I'm a purchased possession. The Lord has purchased me with His, His own blood. you will hold your place here in Luke 5 and look with me if you would please to Galatians chapter 2 in verse number 20 this verse is quickly becoming my favorite verse and I'm contemplating changing my life verse to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 I believe it's okay if you change your life verse I don't think it's a sin look what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 Paul writes, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And note the ending of the verse. The apostle writes, he says, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We're to live by faith. We're to live for God's glory alone. And as we look back in Luke chapter 5, we're introduced to a man by the name of Simon. As I mentioned before, he's, he's a man, there's really nothing spectacular about this man. I believe he was religiously minded in that he was a Jewish man. I believe he faithfully attended synagogue every week. And that he was familiar with the law of God and was praying and looking forward to the coming of the Messiah as was the entire Jewish nation. But on this particular day, a man, but not just any man, the Lord Jesus Christ literally stepped into his life and changed him forever. When Peter died, he died crucified upside down. Because he did not want his death to resemble that of Jesus Christ. He was a strong man. He was a very vocal man. I believe he had some, some uh, nervous habits in his life. You remember when he was on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ and and the glory of, of, of God shined through Jesus. I believe he got nervous. That's why he said, hey, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And God the Father had to speak from heaven and say, this is my beloved son, hear him. In other words, shut up, Peter. Just pay attention to what's going on here. Don't miss, don't miss what God has for you. But this day, began like an ordinary day for Peter. He had worked all night as a fisherman. He and 
the sons of thunder, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were partners, business partners, in this fishing trade. And as they had brought their ships back to land, they began to do what they had always done. They had to do maintenance. They had to repair their nets. They had to clean their boats. And on this particular occasion, they did have less work to do because Peter reveals later on in this passage that they had toiled all night and had caught nothing. But Jesus comes and this great multitude is following Jesus. This is early on in in Jesus' earthly ministry. And and now he comes to Peter and, and he says, hey, and he just gets in his boat. Can you imagine Peter sitting in his boat, mending his nets, and all of a sudden this man comes and gets in his boat with him. That'd be a little strange, wouldn't it? How many of you would think it strange if you're sitting in the parking lot and somebody you did not know opens the door and gets in your car? Says, hey, take me for a little drive. (laughs) This is exactly what happens to Peter. To thrust out a little bit from the land. And there Jesus began to teach the people And when he had left off teaching, there was a greater lesson that that God had for Peter. We don't know exactly what Christ had, had taught there that day upon the shores of the Sea of Galilee. But he was not there by accident. And may I tell you this morning, Christians, he is here intentionally today. Just as you are here, sometimes you think, you know, I get up, I go to church, and I don't know why I go. It's just a good decent thing to do, get up, put on my Sunday best, go to church, worship God, but you are here for a reason. God has something for you. And Jesus gave Peter the instructions, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Peter, let's go out a little further and let's go catch some fish. Will you, this morning, launch out and let down? Will you obey the Lord today? There are three basic lessons I'd like for you to share, or I'd like to share with you this morning. I want you to take out something and write these down. I believe they'll be of great help to you. It'll help us remember them, if nothing else. The first lesson that we find here is that we shouldn't question the commands of Christ. Don't question the commands of Christ. Look what the Bible says in verse number 5. And Simon answering said unto him, and I want you to, I'm going to read this in a manner that kind of gives you the attitude I believe Peter had. Remember, he's, he's been up all night. He has cleaned his nets, he's now folded them neatly, and they're sitting, perhaps, in the hull of his ship. Jesus says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon, answering, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, I will let down the net. I believe Peter questioned the competency of Jesus. Peter knew the Sea of Galilee like the back of his hand. I love to fish. I love to go and I just like to catch stuff. You know what I mean? Fishing is no fun when you don't catch fish. There's just something about it. But Peter, he was a fisherman. Peter knew where the fish were. And even as they were on that sea all the night long, he would go from, how many of you you of you in here are fishermen? I'm going to use a term, you might understand what I mean by this. He went from honey hole to honey hole. Looking for all the fish. For those of you who don't know, a honey hole is the hot spot. That's where all the fish are. 
And Peter knew exactly where the fish would be. But they weren't there. And the way Peter and James and John fished was much more arduous than we fish. We have rods and reels. They had very heavy nets. That they would cast into the water weighted nets so they would not simply float upon the water, but that they would be submerged and then they would draw them up out of the sea. And they would become saturated with water. They would become much heavier, much more wearisome. Peter said they had toiled all the night. The word toil means they are physically fatigued. I said, Lord, Master, I'm, I'm tired. We have toiled all night. You don't know what you're talking about. But there was something in Peter's heart, in Peter's conscience, that that spurred him to obey. And may I tell you, I believe it was the words that Jesus had already preached that day there by the Sea of Galilee. He recognized that there was something different about this man, but he could not put his finger on it. He understood that Jesus had authority. I want you to mark your or hold your place here and turn with me back to Luke. I'm sorry, back to Matthew, Matthew chapter number seven. See, Jesus' manner of, of teaching, Jesus' manner of preaching was, was drastically different than anything that Peter, James, or John, or anyone who comprised that multitude that day had ever witnessed. And we see this manner. Uh, at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, not far from where this miracle took place that we're in this morning, about uh, on the, still on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee, on the eastern, north, northeastern side, there is a, there's a hillside where Jesus preached His great Sermon on the Mount. And as the multitudes gathered, they heard Christ preach. He brought them from what they knew to what God actually meant. And the Bible says this at the end of chapter number 7, in verse 28 and 29, it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine. For He taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Why did Jesus teach with authority? Because it's His Word. He's the God of all creation. This book is His. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Sometimes the Lord is going to ask of us to do things. He's going to command us to do things that in our own human logic make no sense. But may I tell you, His Word is perfect. And He will never ask you to do something that will harm you. He will never, do, he will never ask you to do something that will hurt you or hinder you. His way is always best. Don't question the commands of Christ. Notice the second lesson I'd like for you to write down this morning is this. As you look back in verse number 6 and 7 of Luke 5, we find this, that we are not to hinder God's work with incomplete obedience. Don't hinder God's work with incomplete obedience. As you look here in in chapter number 5 of Luke, we find the command of Jesus in verse 4. It's simple. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Notice The word nets, it's plural, meaning, I mean, I'm not the most intelligent man in the world, but when you put an S at the end of the 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 word, it makes it plural, meaning more than one. Let down your nets. There's more than one here. Could be two, could be three, could be four. Your nets. You know what it implied? 
it implied everything that Peter had. It included all of his nets. Let down your nets for a draught. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. He didn't obey fully. He did not obey completely. Look what the Bible says in verses 6 and 7. It says, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. And may I tell you, the time of day they were fishing, that was unnatural. This is a miraculous work of God. Amen. The fish at this time of day, man, has anybody ever been to Israel? I went in February and it was still hot. The fish would go down deep in the heat of the day to avoid the warm water. They would go down where the water was cooler, where there was, where there was uh, less sunlight, where they were more comfortable. And at night they would come back up to the top and they would eat. That's why Peter and James and John fished all night. They didn't fish all day. They fished all night. And still to this day, I remember looking out my hotel window in Tiberias, looking out over the Sea of Galilee early in the morning, just watching the sun crest over the top of the Golan Heights. And you could see the fishing boats coming ashore. Nothing has changed in 2,000 years. This is a work of God. You know what I find interesting? That God blessed even in spite of Peter's disobedience. You might say, well, well pastor, how did he disobey? He put down the net. That's, my, that's exactly the case. He did not obey fully. May I tell you that, that partial obedience is complete disobedience. I want you to hold your place here and turn quickly, if you would, back to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter number 15. We find the, the, the record of Saul, who we referenced earlier this morning. In 1 Samuel, chapter 15, we find that uh, Saul disobeyed. They smote the Amalekites, and, but did not fully smite the Amalekites. God had instructed him to kill everything and everyone because of the sin of Amalek as the children of Israel journeyed through the wilderness. But he did not do it. And Samuel comes and discovers his, his disobedience. And in verse number 22, the Bible says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. We think of great offerings and great sacrifices. It's what I can bring. It's what I can give. No, Christians, it's what you do for the Lord in sincerity and in obedience that God cares for. He's not looking for this great production. He's simply looking for obedient hearts. And the Bible says this, for hath the Lord as, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience. I'm sorry, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. It says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. He says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is, an iniqui is as iniquity and idolatry. It's a pretty scathing Indictment, is it not? What does God desire from us today? He wants us to obey. Not partially, but completely. Now here's the question. Is that even possible? I'm going to butcher the quote, so forgive me. D.L. Moody made a statement similar to this, okay? This is not, that way I'm not completely quoting him, so we'll give him some, some where credit where credit's due. D.L. Moody said something along these lines. The world has yet to see what God can do through a man. 
that is completely consecrated to Him. Or completely obedient to Him. The Moody then made this statement. He said, by God's grace, I'm going to be that man. And what did God do with the Moody? The Moody had an 8th grade education. He was a shoe cobbler in Boston. He was poor. His mother sent him off to Boston so he could take care of the family back in, uh, in western Massachusetts. But it's been said of D.L. Moody that he took two continents, one in each hand, North America and Europe, and shook them for God's glory. Millions of people came to know Christ as a result of this man's obedience. He said, by God's grace, I'm going to be that man. So is it, is it possible? Yes. Why? Because the Lord would never ask you to do something that you cannot do by His grace. God blessed in spite of their disobedience. Look back in Luke chapter 5. We'll read the account. The Bible says, And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. I often wonder, how many more fish could they have caught? They caught so many fish. Look what the Bible says in verse 7. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. And I'm not a scientist, but I know math a little bit. And usually the displacement of a ship allows for it to carry more than just a couple things. I, I, I've stumbled on this YouTube channel. You've got to pray for me. <laughs> this is how desperate I am at times. It's like, really, Pastor? You watch that stuff? It's about this man in North Carolina. He gets in a kayak and he paddles a mile or so offshore. And he begins to fish, deep sea fish, in a kayak. <laughs> Yesterday evening, they stumbled on this video. I had my boys, I'm sitting in the, in the armchair, and I've got a boy on this shoulder and a boy on this shoulder, two guys in front of me, and I've got my phone out, and we're looking, we're watching this guy. He's catching these fish, and he caught this big red drum, and he cannot reel the thing in. Yes! It's dragging him around the ocean. And he begins to reel this fish in. And finally, he, he gets it up to, this, to, the, to the surface of the water after he had edited the film. So, I mean, we're not going to watch it for 45 minutes. I'm not that desperate. I can't guarantee that, though. I may have. But he gets this fish in the boat, in his kayak. It's like half the size of the man. The fish was probably 50 pounds on a kayak. But that boat didn't sink. Can you imagine the amount of volume those fish took up in that boat? They began to sink. Remember a few years ago, we went to North Carolina and we rented a boat. And we went all day, we rented this boat, we would go out, we would go fishing for red drum and black drum and, and you know, anything that bites sheep's head in the intercoastal waterway uh, just outside of Wilmington, North Carolina on the Cape Fear River, the Cape Fear Waterway. And we got this great idea that we were going to go get the boys, our boys, and take them for a ride in the boat. There's only one problem. We put too many people in the boat. And so as we pull away from the boat launch, the boat ramp, these other boats are coming up and down the Cape Fear and the water's coming up over the front of the boat. And we're taking on water fast. And my mother-in-law, bless her heart, she's beginning to panic. <laughs> and as quickly as we can, we turn around and unload our cargo. <laughs> We'll have, we're going to have to take some turns here. But the sheer volume. 
what would have happened had they truly obeyed? Imagine what God would have done. Christian, imagine what God can do in your life if you will completely obey the Lord. What's the final lesson that we find here this morning? Look back in Luke chapter 5. And it's simply this. This is what brings it all together. What is, what is the conclusion that we make this morning? The conclusion is found at the end of verse number 11. The Bible says, And when they brought their ships to the land, I want you to take out a pen or a pencil and mark the statement here at the end of verse number 11. They forsook all and followed Him. They forsook all and followed Him. Why? Because they realized who He was. They realized who they were. Look what, look what Peter's response was in verse 8. It says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The reality is, you and I, we can't please God. Amen. And that might sound like a shocking thing to hear. But you can't. Neither can I. The only one who can truly please God is Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. As I yield myself to the Lord, God can use me. As I walk in, in humility and sincerity and in obedience, God can use me. But Christian, if you want to, here's the catch. You've got to forsake all and follow him. Launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a draught. Was the lesson in the fish? No. Was the lesson in the nets? No. The lesson is Jesus. Who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. It's Christ. And the question we ask today is this. Are you following him? You know, I would dare say, in a group this big, there are decisions that need to be made today. Where we need to simply obey God. How many of you want the blessing? Yeah, amen. amen. I want God to do a mighty work, don't you? Yeah. What is it going to take? It's going to take me being obedient. It's going to take me forsaking all and following Christ. Christians, this morning, will you forsake all and follow Jesus? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I invite you to stand with me this morning.